Welcome to FADA's webinar, Hot Topics from Washington. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to review the logistics of today's event. We will be taking questions throughout the panel discussions. At any time during the webcast, please use the Q&A link in the toolbar to submit your questions. And we ask, um, remind you to not use chat as we will not be monitoring this uh, window for audience questions. All articles and resources referenced in this webinar are listed in the webinar resources document, which will be linked in the chat box momentarily. Uh, we will, are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on FADA's website following today's presentation. And finally, as a reminder, the discussions in this webcast are not for media use. For quotes and more information, please contact FADA directly. And now we'd like to introduce FADA Executive Director Tim Kaiser, who will be presenting today's agenda. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Hot Topics in Washington, otherwise known as Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. <laughs> um, there is a lot going on, and that's why many of you have tuned in. So we're going to cover the hot topics. The, the latest on the HUD budget, which just came out last week, the affirmatively furthering fair housing proposed rule, comments are due next month, physical inspections, INSPIRE, the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act, uh, a letter that FADA and the other groups have written to HUD regarding uh, the plethora of regulations that you all are dealing with today. Um, the latest on Build America, Buy America, and Criminal Histories in Tenant Screening. Um, we encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A uh, through that channel, the Q&A channel. I'm pleased to be joined by the policy staff, Jim Armstrong, Arlene Kahn, Michael Webb, David Weber, and Crystal Wojcikowski. So we're going to kick it off with a very important issue, and that is the HUD budget, which just came out last week. And I'm going to ask Arlene Khan now to cover the uh, public and assisted the public housing and assisted housing portions of that budget. Okay, thank you, Tim, and good day, everyone. Uh, just before I jump into the slides, um, I want to mention that. We just finished um, our recommendations for HUD program funding for FY24. And we do that every year with NARO, CLAFA, and the MTW Collaborative. So this two-pager is available on our website and it's also in the resource page that uh, Blake just mentioned uh, in the chat. And you, this is, a, I think, something good to use when you meet with your elected officials, either at home or if you come into DC. Um, just to urge them to support the highest level of funding for HUD programs. And we give you recommendations in all of the core programs for public housing, Section 8 and PVRA. So as you can see on the slide, the increase this year is 1.1 billion, which is only 1.6%. So that's a minor uh, increase when you compare it to last year, where it was almost 7%. And the operating fund formula, not, e not even half a percent increase um, with $24 million. Um, so the industry group is recommending a $5.4 billion increase uh, uh, funding, excuse me, for the operating fund. And um, this is because if when we looked at, at the um, congressional justifications that HUD has to put together in the budget, we saw that their increases uh, used an inflation factor of less than 1%. So we looked at uh, the factors being used by the Congressional Budget Office, and those were the high end of the range was 3.6%. So applying those, we get to a figure closer to $5.4 billion. Um, it is interesting that HUD did note um, a reduction in tenant rents, but since the operating formula is, is still based on rents charged, not rents collected, HUD's number will still be less than accurate, which we continue to point out to them. So we have some work to do there. Um, on the capital fund formula, we only saw a $25 million increase, less than 1%. Um, something interesting in the um, congressional justification for this, though, is that for the first year, 
HUD has um, stated that they've taken, taken the findings from the 2010 app study that we often reference, which showed a $26 billion backlog at that time. So this is 13 years ago with annual needs of 3.4 billion. And now HUD is saying that annual needs are currently higher than 4 billion. Those are the words they used. And the backlog of unmet capital needs has grown to more than 50 billion. So we're saying at least 70 billion, we think it's higher, but it's still interesting that they're picking up on, on some of that. And we're expecting a capital needs assessment later this year, although we've already been advised that it might be somewhat limited due to the resources, the limited resources they have. Um, I'll also just briefly mention, there's an additional $300 million for this new grant program called SPHERE, but my colleague David will talk about that in a few minutes. And then this 80, 185 million is, that's a number of different grant programs combined that address health and safety risks, emergencies, disaster funding, judicial re receiverships for at-risk or troubled PHAs. So that's, that's all of the main points of public housing. Um, moving on to section eight, um, HAP renewals, we, which is usually fully funded is again, we believe fully funded. And, and by that, we mean um, fully funding all existing households who currently have vouchers. And that's, um, you can see the figure 1.4, over 1.4, almost $1.5 billion to just keep even uh, uh, over a 5% increase. And that continues to be a significant increase every year. And um, we often wonder about the challenges that we'll, that we'll face uh, with appropriators every year because those numbers continue to go up so dramatically. Um, there is some interesting language proposed for a demonstration to allow PHEs to use a limited amount of their HAP dollars to assist HCV recipients with tenant leasing ex expenses such as security deposits, utility deposits, and last month's rent when that's required up front for leasing. So we'll watch that language and see if that's picked up by the House and Senate, but that's, a, a, I think, a positive development because if you can't use your HAP money and you want to use some of it for, to help build utilization, that's um, that's a great um, advantage. And then um, the admin fee account is the big story. Um, I wish I had a drum roll, but I don't, but it's a over 15% increase. And we've been seeing some healthy increases already in the last few years, as you know, but it's almost a half a billion dollar increase. Um, and this is estimated by HUD to be a 100% proration. So by comparison, when I began at FADA in 2017, we were in the 70s. And so in that time period, we, we got, we've gotten to 100. And we really have done a lot of advocacy to build that number. And we've had some members who've had great relationships with some of our, uh, for example, Senator Collins and staff in her office have been very receptive to our Hill visits year after year, expressing the importance of funding that account and I'm gonna quote my former colleague, Jonathan Zimmerman, who loved to say, you need people to help people. So if you don't have the staff you need to lease, how can you, you know, get your utilization number up? So that's a really important number. And you know, I hope we'll see something close to that in the House and Senate bills that will come out uh, later this year. PBRA, we expect that to be fully funded, almost a billion dollar increase. So you see these huge increases in the, uh, rental assistance accounts. And with those um, significant numbers in rental assistance, um, HUD has requested $50 million from the tenant-based account and $50 million from the project-based account to be put towards the conversion of um, public housing properties that are unable to convert through RAD to Section 8 using only the funds appropriated uh, through existing appropriations. Um, and HUD's estimating that with that funding, an additional 30,000 units could be converted. Um, so there's some other um, language about RAD that's been there in the last few years, but just I'll just mention a couple, removing the cap on public housing units that may convert, and also eliminating the September 30th, 2024 sunset date by which housing authorities can apply for RAD. So we'll, we'll see what happens with those as well. Um, so there is, um, I, oh, I, I did want to mention too this one other thing, ensuring the uh, continued availability of services for residents following a RAD conversion. And that has to do with programs like Job, Jobs Plus, Ross, and Congregate Housing Services Program. 
um, which was actually spearheaded by our past president, John Hodge, who had such um, a contract. And um, so now you can continue to have those contracts and they'll be eligible for new renewal at the completion of the grant term, which was a problem previously um, under different kinds of conversions. So that's a really positive. Um, so uh, let's see, going down to uh, new incremental vouchers. There is 50 mil, 50, 565 million proposed for an additional 50,000 households. So that number in the Biden budget is about a third of what it was last year. Um, and there is also a statement about a, another additional uh, 130,000 households that would be assisted through MTW and non-MTW program reserves. So we have some questions to ask HUD about that because that language was somewhat vague and we're, we're actually meeting with HUD tomorrow and have a question into them about that and we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, Sarah, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is um, something new in the budget this year. And I'll just make a preliminary statement to say, you know, the president's budget is, it's his blueprint for his, what his vision of government should be. So to that end, in addition to the traditional spending that we just discussed that works through congressional appropriations process, uh, the president has also included significant mandatory funding this year, which is funding that is not subject to appropriations, but does add to the overall cost of the budget. And you, I'm not going to run through all these. You can, you can see what they are for yourselves on the slide. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, we understand the messaging that the president's budget you know, wants to make. We, we understand he wants to show that these extreme housing needs exist across the country and these kinds of investments would address these needs in a very direct way. So we appreciate these numbers, but the reality is that we have majority members in the house talking about massive cuts to discretionary spending, which includes HUD funding in exchange for raising the debt ceiling, which Tim will talk about in a few minutes. And some have even said they want to eliminate the voucher program completely. So in that environment, these mandatory proposals will likely not be seriously entertained. Uh, Sarah, you can put up the last slide, which is just, um, this is a summary of some of the major programs. Um, and uh, I guess I would say in my closing com comments, ultimately it's up to Congress to determine whether there'll be new mandatory funding and what the appropriations will be for all of these programs. To that end, we've heard that um, the expectation this year is that the appropriations process will be completed before the August recess and the start of the fiscal year, which is October 1st. Um, that If that happens, that will be the first time in a long time. Uh, but one important consideration for the overall budget is that FHA receipts, which receipts, I'm saying, <laughs> it's hard to, to say that word, which HUD receives to offset its budget are down by $7 billion. And rental assistance program costs have increased by $6 billion just to keep assisted house, assisted people housed. So that puts the overall budget, uh, HUD budget, $13 billion short this year. And that's going to be a major challenge. So all of these factors will put a strain on appropriations for HUD programs, but we will continue to keep you apprised, including in the next edition of The Advocate and in May at our Denver conference, where you hope you, we hope you will join us. So thank you. And I will now turn it over to my colleague, David Weber. Okay, I'm trying to put my camera on. I don't know why. There we go. Am I? Am hello? Can you hear me? Am I visible? There we go. Um, yes. So I just want to make a couple of comments uh, based on the information. This slide, the project-based rental assistance number does include uh, 258 million for about 2,200 new uh, supportive housing units under the Section 202 and 811 programs. Um, you know, choice is down significantly, uh, but there's still a lot of money in the pipeline. You know, the last couple of years at 350 million was well above uh, what the program had previously received. So there's uh, still going to be uh, opportunities there. The increase in home uh, includes a $100 million first home down payment program. Uh, and I'll touch more on that in a second. And I will also note that the 
the CDBG number, um, you know, has a has a had a blank in it where uh, last year they plugged in earmarks. Uh, so we that's also going to be a piece of the uh, of the discussions. You know, next slide, if you could. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other things in the budget. I wanted to note the fair housing assistance and the fair housing initiative programs have increased funding as that continues to be uh, part of the administration's uh, sort of equity priorities. Um, the land use reform grants at 85 million, uh, they didn't, there, this was included also in last year's uh, approved budget, but they have not yet issued an OFA. Uh, it's a very small version of the uh, piece that you saw proposed on the on the mandatory side, uh, where 10 billion was proposed. So some of the mandatory side things could find their way in much smaller scale into a regular budget potentially. As Arlene mentioned, there's the Sphere grants, which stand for site-based public housing enhancement, resiliency, and efficiency. Uh, and there's 280 million there. Um, also, I would note that. These, you know, you include this, there's also still a lot of money from the infrastructure and inflation reduction acts related to, uh, you know, reducing carbon footprints and uh, disaster resilience uh, and energy efficiency. So, uh, you know, I think what I noted here is that, you know, these are going to be competitive. Um, I'm sorry, the sphere grants, uh, capital improvements. Uh, for energy, water, or resilience uh, to natural disasters. If you include the appropriate design features, you can include that in your capital stack potentially. Um, the uh, I would say the land use grants will go to uh, update zoning, land use, permitting, and creating infrastructure for housing, uh, and mostly will go to appropriate jurisdictions that have uh, some authority over land, land use zoning and permitting. Less, uh, as I mentioned, this new first home down payment assistance program for first generation or low wealth home ownership, those will primarily go uh, to states um, and, and other uh, jurisdictions. There's also a couple of, there's some other policy items that Arlene did mention uh, that they're proposing. Uh, the red provisions, I don't know, if, I don't recall if uh, Arlene mentioned, do allow sort of the use or the carryover of public housing reserves in a RAD transaction. Uh, there's also uh, support for uh, moving to triannual recertification to support wealth building. They have again included a, a rescinding uh, the community service and self-sufficiency requirement. Uh, and again, a proposed capital and operating fund flexibility uh, and also biennial selection of flat rents um, uh, among the various policy proposals that are included. Uh, so with that, I guess we'll, I will turn it back to Tim, uh, who will talk about the debt ceiling and the context in which all this is going to be worked out. Tim? Thank you, Arlene and David, uh, for that synopsis of the HUD proposed budget. I want to take a few minutes and just talk about the debt ceiling. This is not a new issue. It's come up many times in recent years. I think most people know that once the U.S. government hits a certain point, it cannot spend beyond its effective credit card limit without congressional approval. And in fact, we've already hit that credit card limit, but the U.S. Treasury is employing what it calls extraordinary measures to keep paying its bills. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has pointed out that these measures will likely be exhausted sometime in July to September in that range. Now, you've read and heard a lot about the debate on this issue. President Biden is saying that he wants a clean extension of the debt ceiling. Uh, that's what's been enacted over the last 10 to 12 years. We've had clean extensions, even though the debate has been rancorous at times. Um, there was a, an imposition of sequestration about a decade ago, which was problematic. But in any case, the president is calling for a clean extension. The House majority uh, believes the budget path is unsustainable. 
and it will it says it will oppose an extension unless there is an agreement by the White House and the Senate to address the debt situation. Uh, the potential consequences of this situation are unprecedented. Certainly, if the U.S. government defaults on its debt, that could lead to problems in our budget accounts and uh, an economic catastrophe. So in short, the fight on this is over the fact that we've accumulated $31 trillion in debt at this point. And many people on both sides of the aisle acknowledge that this situation is unsustainable. They disagree on exactly how to approach it, however. Uh, so that is what the, the debate really centers on. Um, I would like to just, you know, to give you a synopsis of how the problem is, is observed by credible entities. The Washington Post had an editorial just last week, and I will quote from that briefly. Quote, an unfortunate mindset has grown among our nation's leaders. It is that the United States can overspend by more than $1 trillion a year indefinitely. This willful blindness to reality on the part of national policymakers has allowed the national debt to rise to more than $31 trillion. And uh, the, uh, the editorial goes on to note that just the interest payments annually on this debt will soon equal total Pentagon spending annually and will total about $10 trillion over the next decade. So what we're facing here is kind of an, another game of chicken between the Congress and the president. Uh, we've seen this before. Um, the House majority is preparing legislation that would prioritize payments to creditors in light of uh, a debt default. The Treasury Department says that kind of a plan simply is not workable for many reasons. The credit rating entity Moody's estimates that we will, that Treasury will exhaust these extraordinary measures by around mid-August. Nobody knows what for certain what the date is. It will be sometime over the summer. So it's imperative that the House, Senate, and White House work out an arrangement, a deal on this. I would, uh, I would, if, 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 when you're talking with your legislators, I would strongly encourage them to work out some kind of a compromise on this really important issue, because the consequences, as I said, could be catastrophic. So, with that, Blake, I believe we have one or two questions we could take, and then. We'll move on to the next topic after that. Right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, so we do, uh, just a reminder that we are going to be taking questions throughout this um, webinar at the end of each um, topic. Um, and then we will also have time at the end of the entire uh, webinar for, for further questions. Uh, but as of right now, we have one um, uh, asking if there are any offsets for HAP in the budget. Sorry, I need to unmute. Okay, so um, this, I guess, is to Cindy. Uh, there is uh, HUD does request authority in the budget to offset renewal funding allocations for PHAs with excess reserves, not defined, and reallocate the resulting budget authority to PHAs that have the capacity to lease up additional vouchers. Uh, it also says HUD would give preference to PHAs with previous renewal funding offset due to excessive reserves but with demonstrated increased capacity through improved voucher utilization following the offset. And as I said earlier, we will ask some more questions about reserves uh, as they factor in to a number of places in the budget. Uh, we also have another question here. What are the changes to, uh, to the RAD or disposition, uh, disposition program? Well, I said a few of them. Um, let me see if I can get a few others up here. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Well, the funds that will help agencies convert, that's one thing, that's just funds. Um, eliminating the sunset, removing the cap, uh, the, the, the service programs being available after a conversion. Um, did someone want to say something? Uh, this is David. I, I would also the the ability they are proposing again the, the ability to uh, re utilize or retain carry public housing reserves over uh, for the rented property. Okay. Right. That that's current currently restricted. Um, that's a, those are the main ones. Yep. Okay, Blake, I think we want to move on to the next topic. Sure thing. So uh, we will um, uh, move on then. Um, Jim Armstrong will now uh, lead us on the next topic on the fair housing rule. Jim. Thank you, Blake. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure of summarizing 70 pages of federal regulation and 10 years of history in five minutes. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, as you probably know, the department's been trying for over 10 years to revise the process it uses to enforce an affirmatively furthering fair housing standard. In 2015, they published a proposed rule that imposed a fairly significantly burdensome process on CDBG recipients, home recipients, a few other kinds of grantees and housing authorities. And some housing authorities did submit uh, 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 analyses under that uh, 2015 rule. With the change in administrations, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development suspended implementation of that rule, replaced it with, um, well, basically a, a fairly uh, innocuous and uh, um, irrelevant process that we've been living under for about five years. In February of this year, February 9th, the department published a proposed rule to implement a, uh, an affirmatively furthering fair housing process that is quite similar to the one that they published back in 2015. A few things have changed. Um, the department claims that there's been some streamlining with that, with that new rule. Uh, some of the things that have changed, uh, the name of the document uh, grantees will have to submit, program participants that are referred to in the rule will have to submit is called an equity plan rather than an assessment of fair housing. Um, the department will no longer publish forms for program participants to submit, but have included a series of 60 to 70 questions that program participants will have to address in their submissions to HUD. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the department's publication uh, has got lengthy descriptions of its justifications uh, for this new process. And uh, the streamlining that they've proposed basically helped the department out. They have um, extended the period of time they're allowing themselves to review submitted equity plans. And under the old rule, they had to complete their review within 60 days. In the current proposal, they're proposing a period of 180 days. They're also eliminating from some fairly significant procedural requirements on their part by eliminating forms. They no longer have to go through the OMB approval process for forms, and, and they, they plan to publish all of the questions that program participants need to answer in the final regulation. They've also included uh, uh, continuing requirements, at what, what were called public participation requirements under the 2015 rule. They're now calling community engagement um, that requires a fairly significant amount of public participation and public engagement around uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing. They're also uh, uh, proposing to accept uh, comments and complaints from the public concerning assessment of fair housing compliance. So the public would be able to submit comments concerning proposed equity plans that have been submitted to HUD and, and also final equity plans after they've been submitted to HUD. And presumably the department will be required to address those comments in some fashion. And they've also opened the door to 
the public submitting complaints alleging that uh, program participants, CGBG grantees and housing authorities in particular, have failed to meet their obligation and they will have to establish a process to address those, to address those complaints. Um, the proposal includes, I think, a lot of work without promising much impact on the issues of fair housing and housing integration, which they're designed to address. Uh, program participants will have to submit plans every five years uh, on a schedule that's driven by the due date for, for housing authorities purposes, is the due date for their five-year plan. Every program participant will also have to submit an assessment, uh, progress assessment annually. And as I said, the department will have to address public comments and complaints during those periods of time as well. So one of the issues that we're concerned about is, is not just is the burden that this proposal imposes on everyone. Um, the burden seems to be fairly serious for program participants. Um, some of the uh, analyses of uh, uh, the uh, assessments of fair housing that were submitted uh, were very lengthy and when people engaged consultants were very expensive. Um, it's not likely that these, these documents will be much shorter under the, the new regime, at least not as far as I can tell. And so the department is gonna be receiving, uh, once final implementation is in place, the department's gonna be receiving approximately 1,000 equity plans annually and approximately 5,000 um, uh, annual assessments of progress that they'll have to review and consider. A major concern that we have has to do with um, uh, the priorities that this kind of thing represents. It seems to me that uh, the department has again, again proposed a process that essentially, to my mind, is wagging the dog. Um, housing uh, ought to be uh, housing ought to be uh, a primary goal. It seems to me, and in, under this process, housing becomes a it comes to be in service to fair housing goals. It, it asks agencies to analyze matters beyond their expertise and their authority, both in terms of content. So there are still requirements for agencies to analyze what the rule refers to as community assets, that is um, uh, economic opportunities, employment opportunities, transportation networks, the quality of the educational system and schools to which people's children are, are assigned. Um, and other other community assets that might be uh, that they've included matters such as parks and recreational opportunities. They also are still requiring a regional analysis on the part of program participants uh, that would require agencies to evaluate their housing issues in regions far beyond their jurisdictions over which they exercise no authority or control. Um, and we remain concerned about that possibility. The department encourages agencies to um, uh, collaborate on submitting equity plans as much as they possibly can. And that would be collaboration within a community. So for example, um, if a city uh, or, or region has multiple housing authorities or uh, multiple CDBG grantees and home grantees and housing authorities, um, they're encouraging people to consider collaborating on submitting these plans, but in its assessment of burden, they only expect a relatively small proportion of these plans to be submitted uh, in collaboration. Uh, it was interesting to me, the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has collected assessments of fair housing that were submitted after the 2015 rule, and it looks as though about half of those were submitted as joint submissions between localities that are receiving CDBG funds and housing authorities. And in one case, uh, Missouri submitted a regional analysis that covered a pretty significant number of local governments and local housing authorities. So there is a drive for, the, for agencies to consider, uh, consider collaborating with other entities uh, in preparing these uh, equity plans. And finally, um, an issue that's come up in discussions with some of our housing committee members um, revolves around small agencies and particularly small agencies in rural communities. Um, one member pointed out that these 
agencies use, often are not in localities that are CDBG recipients, so they're the only program participant in their jurisdiction, and the only opportunity they have to collaborate is to collaborate with the straight state CDBG grantee. And so the question then becomes whether states will be willing to take on responsibility for collaborations with large numbers of relatively small, relatively rural housing authorities. And, in, and if not, it's likely many of those agencies will have to conduct this analysis on their own. Um, the department expects most agencies would be able to complete this kind of equity plan on their own. Uh, in looking again at the MIT information, a significant proportion of submissions appear to have been prepared by consultants. In some of its regulatory publications over the past five years, the department has said that generally speaking, they found the quality of plans that were submitted by local program participants, that is housing authorities and CDBG grantees, were better in quality than the ones prepared by consultants. So. Um, uh, that's a matter for agencies to keep in mind. And one of the problems with this is, again, uh, um, uh, trying to make sure that the main thing involving our programs and HUD is to keep the main thing the main thing. We're facing a housing crisis that demands expansion of inventory and expansion of inventory available to low and moderate income households. And um, this, this particular kind of regulatory process uh, appears to divert a significant amount of uh, resources, both money and human resources, um, from keeping our eye on the issue of housing and housing quality and paying more attention to procedural compliance with a proposed rule. We encourage members to, um, uh, uh, to consider submitting comments. Those are due on April 10th. Uh, we will be publishing some material that you can use to sort of guide those comments. But most importantly, if you choose to make comments, is to make comments based on impacts that you expect in your local community uh, and make them as tailored as you possibly can to your local circumstances. Um, and um, without, without proposing to go any further into the weeds than I already have, I think I'd like to leave any remaining time available for questions if there are any. We don't currently have any questions and in the interest of time, we have a lot to cover today. We're gonna to go right ahead to, uh, to Crystal Wojcikowski, uh, who is gonna be presenting an update on Inspire. Crystal. Hi, uh, thank you, Blake. Um, so I, um, wanted to give you all an update on the national standards for the physical inspection of real estate for PHAs. Um, so we have a big date coming up on April 1st as far as uh, the implementation of INSPIRE, uh, specifically in the public housing um, program. Um, I had hoped that at this call I would have some great news that our scoring protocol was um, out for public comment. Um, it is currently um, not available, but I'll get into more details about what um, we have now, what we're still waiting on in just a few minutes. Um, but for someone, um, if Inspire is um, new to you, just a quick 30-second um, background. Um, so Congress directed the department to align standards um, for a number of reasons, mostly related to just challenges um, that the industry um, and your agencies have already been aware of over the last 20 years. Um, related to inconsistency across inspection protocols um, and unreliability and the inability to replicate results across um, even within within the agency. Um, Inspire really pivots the focus more towards the interior of the unit. So where areas where residents spend their time um, versus in the past where you've seen, you know, big deductions and points related to things in the exterior, like erosion or vegetation. Um, and so it takes the focus from the exterior more to the interior so that you can focus on the health and safety of your residents. Um, not that you're not already doing that, but really so that this inspection protocol um, pays more attention to those things um, that directly affect the residents on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it really is a move away from things like industry standard repairs. Um, so in general, um, we are very supportive of um, the potential changes. We just have not had the opportunity to fully comment 
on um, the entire standard as a whole. Uh, so the demonstration started in 2019. Um, again, like I mentioned, in public housing, the implementation date is April 1st. Um, for um, voucher program and multifamily, that date is further out just by a few months for um, October 1st. Though you may have been hearing, um, I saw HUD um, tweeted out that while they're not really mentioning that implementation date, they are stating that their go live date of Inspire um, will be later this summer. Um, so if you are expecting, if you have not had um, an, a UPCS inspection, if you're inspect, if you were expecting one April 1st, um, you can likely anticipate an Inspire inspection starting in July. So to prepare for the summertime. Um, so recently, HUD has been um, going around across the country. They've been hosting get ready sessions in various regions um, where, where this is their opportunity to be as transparent as possible to give you as much information as they have available related to upcoming milestones, um, the standards, which are currently available online, um, to give more information about the administrative notice, um, some background on the scoring protocol, though not the scoring protocol itself, and then some other topics and opportunities for um, members, for housing authorities um, and other stakeholders to provide um, comment and feedback. Um, so their last session was in DC um, just a few weeks ago. Um, HUD has stated that it was recorded for those who are unable to attend in person, so that is available to you. I did look for it this morning. Um, I was not able to find it immediately on the Inspire website. Um, so if, if um, I will reach out to react directly to ask for that link in case any of you need it, um, if you were, native, were not able to get to those Inspire sessions in person, um, let us know, reach out to us um, uh, by email and we can get that link to you for the, the YouTube recording. Um, so what we have right now, um, we do have version 2.2 of the standards, which is easily found on Inspire's website. Um, those have been current for the last, I would say, about six months. Um, generally, the standards are significantly improved compared to UBCS, um, but we do continue to have concerns related to tenant cause damages, especially because um, much of the deficiency criteria will, will now be, a large portion of the deficiency criteria will now be inside the unit. Um, it's really important that we um, have a, a discussion with HUD about how do tenant cause damages affect your score. Um, we have expressed concerns about that from the start, um, and we have been told that these um, could potentially be addressed in an administrative notice that we have not seen yet, so coming soon. Um, and we've also been concerned, um, highly concerned with funding. Um, the standards do make um, some changes based on um, new laws, one including related to smoke detectors, um, but that is an unfunded change. So there could be, um, there will be, additional costs that your agency will need to um, purchase those items, um, but HUD does not address um, that funding need. So we also had the proposed rule, which was issued in January 2021 for the protocol itself. Um, we did submit comments in March of 2022, um, but HUD has not issued a final rule at this time. Um, so we're currently missing that final rule where HUD addresses um, our comments and other stakeholder comments. Um, we are awaiting this scoring notice, which in my opinion is the most significant portion of um, this entire program. Um, though HUD has been fairly transparent um, with changes to the standards, they have um, failed to provide us the scoring notice in a timely manner so that we can provide overarching comments to the program as a whole and any potential um, unintended consequences. Um, and we are still waiting that administrative notice. Um, the administrative notice would include um, things that um, there shouldn't, HUD has stated that there will not be too many um, changes to the administrative notice, but um, even a small change could affect your agency related to, you know, what does the scoring system mean? Um, if you were to fail um, a INSPIRE inspection, what does that mean? If you need to submit a technical um, adjustment or technical correction or database adjustment, how would you handle that? Um, or how do you submit waivers or appeals? How do you prepare for an inspection? What happens post-inspection? All of those items will be in the administrative notice, so we are still waiting on that. Um, we have been waiting on these items since December. Um, we have been told many times that these uh, 
documents will be released soon. Um, we're still waiting any opportunity we have to ask HUD. We always ask for these documents. Um, and so as soon as we have them, we will let you know they will be on our website. We'll also provide um, a detailed analysis of those. Um, when we do receive the scoring notice, we'll have 30 days to comment, but we will not have an opportunity to comment on the administrative notice. Um, so just for um, a little additional background is we have been requesting deferment of the implementation date of April 1st repeatedly. We've sent emails to, um, to directly to HUD, um, to Ashley Sheriff directly, also Dominique Blum, um, basically stating that there has not been enough time to review these all of these as a whole um, so that we can provide an analysis and really help prepare agencies um, for this. Um, we have not, um, we've been pushing for this. We have not received um, that allowance, um, though they have decided to push those inspections back through July. So um, we will continue to push, um, even knowing that we don't have the scoring nor the administrative notice, even July seems very soon. So we'll continue to push um, not only to push those dates back, but maybe even to have advisory scores for the first one or two years. Um, and so knowing what we have now and what we do not have at this time, um, I did just want to talk briefly about what your ag agency can do to prepare um, in lieu of these items now. So um, what you could do if you haven't already is review the standards which are available. Um, also share them with your inspection teams, um, anyone um, that that might be helpful to that could be assisting with the um, transition to Inspire. Share those standards now. They're very detailed. They go into um, all the deficiency criteria. Um, exactly what it would look like if you were doing the inspection yourself. So it, it is it provides lots of information. Um, and you can also review those get ready session slides specifically um, for a little bit more detail about criteria and scoring. And then utilize both of those things to really just prepare your teams when they're inside the units doing the annual certification, um, annual inspections. Um, if they're in there for work orders, they can start to take a look um, and see where you might need um, to start to focus in your efforts through the summer. Um, so again, we'll continue to push. We'll provide any updates as soon as we have them. Um, there'll be breaking news as soon as the scoring or the administrative notice is available. Um, and please reach out to us if you have comments or if you um, have any questions or concerns about how to best prepare if you know that you'll have an inspection this summer. Thank you, Crystal. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to proceed to uh, to Michael uh, to Michael Webb. Uh, we will get to uh, any unanswered questions at the end of the webinar. So now we'd like to um, have Michael Webb talk about ATMA. ATMA. Uh, so like Jim, I've got five to seven minutes to summarize a 300-page final rule that came out last month. Uh, so in February, HUD released the final rule uh, for ATMA sections 102, 103, and 104. Um, I'll just talk about those sections in order, and then we'll talk a bit about implementation at the end. Uh, so section 102, uh, very broadly has big changes to income recertification procedures, income calculations, and income deductions. And again, I'm just going to give the highlights here. Uh, in terms of recertifications and income determinations, uh, HAMA allows housing authorities to use income determinations uh, for many other both state and federal benefit programs, uh, including WIC, SSI, TANF, etc. Uh, HAMA stipulates that initial income determinations and interim research will be based on anticipated income for the coming year for the family, while annual research will be based on the prior year's income. Uh, HADMA also establishes a 10% threshold for changes in income to trigger executing an interim recertification. So if a family comes to you and they've got a change in income, it has to be either a 10% increase or decrease for it to trigger an interim research although agencies may adjust that threshold lower uh, from that 10%. Uh, and fairly good news though, I think for housing authorities, uh, the EID is discontinued, although people receiving the EID uh, will continue to receive it uh, until that term ends. Uh, it also allows housing authorities to adopt a policy not to use uh, EIV at interim research. Uh, and then finally, housing authorities may also adopt a policy to not conduct interim recertifications in the last three months of a certification period. Uh, Section 102 also makes quite a few changes to what is and what is not considered income. Uh, a lot of these are going to be edge cases that only impact some of your families, 
Uh, but for those families, it will probably have a fairly significant impact on their income. Um, the HOTMA proposed rule for Section 102, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, had removed the exclusion of temporary, non-recurring, or sporadic income uh, from income calculations. Uh, however, and FADA had advocated for this, the final rule does restore the exclusion of that type of income. But the rule notes specifically that income from day laborers, independent contractors, and seasonal workers is not considered temporary, non-recurring, or sporadic, and is thus considered income. And then finally, this is another fairly big change. Uh, HOTMA raises the threshold for imputing assets from $5,000 to $50,000. And then in terms of deductions, uh, HOTMA increases the deduction for elderly and disabled households to $525. And it makes that deduction and the dependent deduction subject to inflation adjustments. Uh, it also increases the threshold for claiming medical and disability expenses to 10% of income from its current 3%, although there is a mandatory hardship policy in there that agencies must implement for households that are unable to pay the higher, in, uh, the higher rent. So Section 103 in HATMA concerns over-income policies. Uh, these only apply to public housing families, although you'll note there from the slide, the deadline for implementing these policies is a lot sooner than it is for Sections 102 and 104. Uh, so in 2019, PIH issued a notice that increased the over-income limit to 120% of AMI. Uh, what HATMA does is it stipulates how agencies must deal with families that are over-income. Uh, so once you determine a family that is over income, they have a 24 month grace period. Uh, they must be informed of their over income status when they're determined to be over income and then at 12 and 24 months prior or subsequent to that, excuse me. Uh, if a family were to be were to dip below the over income threshold during that grace period and then they became over income again, their clock would reset. So they'd be entitled to a new 24 month grace period. However, for families that exhaust that 24 month grace period, uh, there's two options for housing authorities. Uh, one is that they can continue in their unit as a non-public housing over income family. Uh, they've got to pay the higher of the FMR or the total subsidy. Uh, the second option is termination where housing authorities may give families up to six months after that grace period ends to remain in the unit. Uh, they go on a month to month lease. And if they do have an income decrease during that six month period, uh, they still got to be terminated at the end of that grace period. They, they don't get to be, they don't get to continue in their unit. Uh, and then finally, section 104, this is probably the most straightforward of these three sections. Uh, it includes limitations on for eligibility based on assets. Uh, so eligibility, is, eligibility, excuse me, is restricted if a family has over 100,000 in assets, uh, that threshold will be adjusted annually for inflation, or if it owns real property suitable for occupancy as a residence, uh, retirement and educational savings accounts are excluded from that restriction. And the rule also has a lot of exceptions for that residency restriction, uh, including if the residency doesn't meet disability accessibility requirements, or if the family doesn't have the legal ability to sell the property, like it's a, fract a fractional ownership situation. And again, a big thing about Section 104 is that housing authorities may choose to enforce this restriction or not for either some or all of their families. So you can see there at the bottom, we've got some key implementation dates. So for section 102 and 104, uh, the date is Jan 1, 2024. Uh, I should note that that date is contingent on HUD rolling out the Housing Information Portal, or HIP, which is the uh, successor to PIC, um, because HUD is not going to program any of these income changes into PIC. Uh, the OI policy, uh, that's the quickest one. Uh, you'll need to update your ACOPS uh, by June 14th, 2023. Uh, and again, we will have more information on HOTMA changes at the Denver conference. I uh, will continue to keep you updated in the advocate. And you can also consult uh, HUD's HOTMA resource page uh, for some additional resources as well. And just a final note in the last 45 seconds I have, uh, we do expect, fingers crossed, a final rule for sections 101, which concerns HQS changes, and 106, which are PBV changes. Uh, both of those were in HOTMA uh, sometime this calendar year. And there's also a PIH notice that came out on Monday for that has more income, more information, excuse me, on the over income uh, policies as well. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions um, and we'll start 
uh, with this um, uh, question on hardship designation. Uh, uh, some hardship designation gives me some heartburn. And how how uh, does the housing authority decide if a tenant should be a hardship? I would have to consult the notice again. I'm happy to follow up with you, uh, Cindy, afterwards. I believe it's a fairly automatic process for considering a hardship. But again, I'll have to look at the notice again, and I'm uh, happy to get back to you on that. OK, uh, this next question for OI, uh, you cannot use PH funds to maintain. So what happens if a resident calls in a work order? Uh, that is something that we are trying to get information from HUD on. And again, it's something that I'll be happy to follow up with you again. I think HUD has uh, got the cart before the horse on some of these rules. And I think they're trying to play catch up on those as well. Okay. Uh, and this question, uh, will there be a training or information session on the details around this change in HOTMA? Yeah, so I do actually have an answer to this. Uh, so for the over income policy, uh, HUD had a webinar on March 2nd, uh, and they say that a recording should be available soon on that. Uh, for sections 102 and 104, they're having two webinars. Uh, the first one is on May 9th, um, and you can sign up for that on HUD Exchange. I want to I want to add to that, uh, that we will have an informational session at our conference on in Denver on HOTMA, the fair housing rule, and, and a lot of these other topics as well. Okay, well, we don't have any more questions now on uh, on HOTMA, so we are going to uh, move next to David Weber, who will be discussing uh, the industry group's recent letter to HUD Secretary uh, Fudge on uh, the deluge of new regulations and requirements. David. Yes, thanks, Blake. Um, so last week, uh, Fado, Nara, Klaffa, and the MTW Collaborative did send a letter to the secretary uh, really asking for her new uh, involvement in creating partnership with housing authorities uh, so we can actually plan together and agree on timelines and implementation plans for all of the new things that are coming down and that they want these to be successful, uh, you know, the best approach is going to be to work with us so we can put a reasonable timeline in place. Uh, the second being that we want HUD to suspend any kind of negative action against HAs that re result from scores uh, based on, on a system that's either outdated or uh, that it hasn't really been fully uh, tested out. Uh, that we don't want negative actions on HAs for things that are outside of their control uh, or don't fairly uh, measure their performance. Um, so those were the two main uh, issues and uh, some of the specific items, there were 10 points, but uh, that we particularly asked for, which was to suspend the ACC reform effort, uh, to modify and work with us on the INSPIRE timeline, to provide FAS and CMAP relief, uh, and to consult with uh, with the industry groups on priorities. Um, we want to make sure that the HOTMA PBV regs are prioritized because that helps, uh, will help to generate additional units. Um, the AFFH needs to recognize uh, the limited jurisdictions and capacity of housing authorities uh, as well, and, and also the limitations on our resource use and our flexibilities, uh, as well as the limitations HUD has when it comes to that, more on uh, you know continuing to extend BABA waivers and providing more guidance, uh, having some real engagement on IT and creating a working group uh, as some of the highlights of where we really want HUD to work with us on setting the timelines for implementing changes. Uh, and that's really all I had on the industry group letter. Are there any questions on that? I don't know if we have a question on that, but I, I did want to add a little bit. Um, I joked at the outset of this session that this is everything, everywhere, all at once. And it does really seem that way right now. I, you know, just, just to give some context, 
what precipitated this letter was a discussion at FADA's meeting in January in Orlando, where our small PHA committee and the housing committee discussed this torrent of new programs and regulations coming down from HUD in the, in the midst of an ending pandemic, but in a situation where we have still significant inflation, supply chain issues, workforce issues, certainly, uh, tenant account receivables still climbing and problematic. And that was really the context for the, for the letter. Um, we were delighted that the other groups uh, agreed and collaborated with us on sending this letter. I think any time the industry groups are literally on the same page, they're more effective in their advocacy, uh, both with HUD and Congress. So we did include that letter in the latest advocate. You can access it. It's available uh, on the on the document. It's available uh, in this in this webinar as well. So take a look at that, and we're going to uh, continue to push that. And in fact, some of you may be planning to be in town next week for the various conferences that are occurring. The industry groups will be meeting jointly with the department on all of these issues to, as David said, express our concern about the volume and the unrealistic expectations, um, especially on Inspire. Um, we have an April 1 startup implementation date, and HUD has not yet responded to our comments, which were filed months and months ago, as Crystal mentioned. So uh, we, we think they're not ready for Inspire. Uh, some of these other programs are, are not ready for implementation. As, as Michael pointed out, HOTMA implementation is uh, contingent on HUD capacity. So I just wanted to add a little bit more background to that. Blake. Yes, there, thank you, Tim. Are there questions, um, Blake? We yes, we do have uh, we do have uh, we have one question um, that was uh, really just whether or not we'd gotten a response from Secretary HUD to the letter. So we sent the letter last Thursday. Uh, today is is Wednesday. Um, we do not yet have a res response from the secretary. The deputy assistant secretary has agreed to meet with the groups to discuss the contents of the letter next week, and we will be meeting with her and her staff. So that will occur next week. And of course, we'll keep members informed about our efforts and success on, on moving uh, some of these implementation dates back. Uh, we have we have two comments that I think are very good. We'd like to read here. Um, one uh, uh, saying that the March the March ninth letter uh, was one of the most succinct and informative letters ever sent to HUD by the industry, and uh, thank you very much for that. We uh, we'd like to remind everyone again that um, this letter, along with other materials, are available in the resources document. So if you've not yet read it, please do. This is a good encouragement to do so. Um, in addition, we have another uh, uh, just comment here, um, you know, thanking Tim and, and, and Fada, you know, trying to find, add trying to find new staff. We have been uh, buried in the new changes, and I can't get it all read before it needs to be implemented. Uh, so again, just just expressing some of the frustrations with this, with yeah. the deluge of, of regulations. I just want to quickly add, I want to credit David Weber for a lot of great work on that letter, and along with Eric Oberdorfer at NARO and, and the folks at CLAFA. Uh, joint collaboration is very important, and uh, we're, we're glad to be working with them on this because these issues affect all of our members, and uh, it necessitates us working together. Okay. Well, we don't have any more questions uh, on this topic, so we are going to go ahead and move ahead. Uh, Crystal Wojcikowski uh, is going to join us again now to talk about BABA, the Build America, Buy America. 
Yes. So Build America by America or BABA. Um, it essentially established a domestic content procurement preference, so by America, um, for all federal financial assistance. Um, so the act um, states that federal agencies may not obligate funds for an infrastructure project unless all of the iron, steel, manufactured products, and construction materials used in the project are produced in the United States. Um, so we, um, lots, I have very few minutes to talk about BABA, so I'll start um, with the most important thing, um, which is um, there was, we did have recently a win. Um, so the department, or so HUD published a phased implementation waiver. This was their second. Um, we submitted comments just a few, about a week ago on March 3rd, um, basically stating um, that they were going to push back the implementation of BABA for um, HUD programs by at least a year. So for some, um, depending on the type of federal um, financial assistance and the type of product that you could purchase um, to at least February of 2023, and in uh, many cases through eight, um, August 23rd of 2024, 2024, sorry about that. So a year from now, at the very least is when BABA would take effect at your agencies. Um, so that phased implementation waiver, it was proposed. Um, the waiver did specifically state that any federal funding that had been obligated by the department between February 22nd of 2023 and when that proposed waiver takes effect um, would essentially be um, waived in under that, um, that waiver. Um, so we've posted a few times in the advocate in a couple of issues that um, there's a chart that was in the notice that states what the funding type is and when it might become effective. And so I encourage you to take a look at the most recent version of the advocate and that is there in a short article based on that phased implementation waiver. Um, so we do have a little bit more time for HUD to address most of our concerns, which to date have still not been um, have not been solved related to finding sourcing marketplaces for um, products and construction materials uh, made in the United States. Um, also, we have yet to see a compliance structure. Um, so during this phased implementation waiver period, the department will be working on um, how to um, provide guidance to you to implement this on the ground. Um, and so we'll be looking closely for that to provide some analyses um, and then also comments if we have the option to do so. Um, but just to note that there had been some other waivers that HUD had um, submitted that are not proposed, they are final. So next year when this does become effective, depending on the project and the financial assistance, um, there are some public interest waivers for de minimis small grants and minor components. Um, there's also a public interest exigent circumstances waiver available for health and safety related issues. And then also there will always be an opportunity on a case by case basis to request a waiver um, if BABA could increase your project by more than 25% um, or if you're not able to find materials um, produced in the U.S. in sufficient or reasonable quality um, quantities. Um, so there are some um, options um, even a year from now, but over the next year, we'll really be pushing the department to provide guidance um, and um, waivers where needed um, starting in February of 2024. Um, and HUD has made um, an acknowledgement that there needs to be greater communication, training, and webinars um, between now and then. So stay tuned um, for what we hope to be more guidance and training um, in the near future so you'll have enough time to prepare for that. Blake, I'm not sure if we have time for oh, questions. Yep. Uh, so we have one here. I'm not actually sure if this is related to Baba or not. Um, uh, so it said, this is a bit, bit lengthy. It's just a moment uh, as I read through this. Uh, an additional burden HUD is placing on PHAs that I've not seen before is the requirement for corrective action plans and quarterly updates on that plan uh, associated with CMAP indicator uh, number 13 reviews in which they are now using. Uh, in which they are now using VMS to assess utilization and lease-ups. Anything under 95% utilization triggers a corrective action plan and follow-up reports. My agency is at 90.9% .9 utilization, which is better than both the national average and my states. I assume others are seeing this as well. 
My, my suggestion would be for the other policy staff to take a look at that question and, and think about a, a response. I, I do want to make sure we get to uh, the criminal records, which David uh, Weber is going to discuss. So if um, uh, others would look at that question, we will definitely get a response to the individual who uh, submitted it, but we, we should go to criminal records. Okay. Yep. Right, so yes, uh, David will uh, update us with that uh, on criminal records uh, now. Thanks. Right. So uh, one, you know, I think folks are aware we've been uh, raising some concerns with HUD for some time around this, uh, and our uh, advocacy appears to have paid off uh, in that uh, HUD has said that they have no plans uh, for new across-the-board rules around restrictions or requirements relating to the use of criminal histories and tenant screening. Um, and they are pursuing through other channels, especially the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, looking at the reliability and the accuracy of information uh, that's available to landlords and housing authorities uh, regarding uh, tenant backgrounds uh, so that they're not holding housing authorities responsible for things that uh, you know, we don't control. Um, I would note, uh, however, that uh, they are still going to be looking at disparate impacts, uh, research and investigations. They've, the Office of Fair Housing has been a sort of training advocacy or, or, uh, groups about how to investigate disparate impacts. New guidance is possible. Uh, and they also will probably be looking also at use of eviction histories as well as criminal histories. Uh, and how you use those that information in your screening policy. Uh, ultimately, I think what they want to see is they want to see local conversations with stakeholders uh, about what the impacts of existing policies are and how policies might be modified to reduce any risk of a disparate impact. Um, so that's really the update. We will certainly keep uh, members posted of any new guidance or any other changes uh, that we see related to this, uh, but it does appear, you know, that as part of their larger equity initiatives, they want to see housing authorities reviewing their policies uh, relating to this. Uh, so I don't know if there's questions uh, out there at this time. We don't have any on that, but we do have a couple of uh, questions that were outstanding from some of the earlier sessions. So. Um, uh, we would like to just move ahead with that and open up the 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 um, the, the Q and A now um, for uh, for either criminal records histories um, or uh, any of the other topics that we'd covered earlier today. Um, so again, uh, the first question we have um, that's related to Inspire um, was asking uh, with Inspire, what about properties that are 20 years short of their 100 year anniversary. Um, Inspire is going to be super difficult in that instance. Yes, thanks Connie for that question. Um, that is a really great point um, that it will become, you know, very challenging to, um, you know, we've been used to, you've been, um, UPCS has been around for so many years and now adjusting, you know, you have the properties that you have, regardless of the inspection protocol. Um, and I think HUD is aware of that. Um, I would um, highly recommend taking a look in the standards for those um, deficiency criteria related to the health and safety inside the unit um, and just take become really familiar with them if you're not already. Um, and, you know, we I, we hate to say that you have to, you know, you just do the best you all you can do is the best that you can do under the system um, that you have, knowing um, the age of your properties. Um, and if any other um, staff team member wants to jump in. Yeah, I, I want to add to that, Crystal. Um, I think that question illustrates a great point that so many properties are old and the capital fund appropriations and HUD budget requests have not been keeping up with needs, nowhere close to it. Mm -hmm. So there, there needs to be a way for the scoring system to somehow factor in the lack of adequate funding to address some of these challenges that agencies have with their properties. 
not to mention all of the increased costs that Inspire will, will result in, right? There's new smoke detector requirements in Inspire. There's all kinds of additional costs that we need congressional appropriations for and HUD, and HUD to request in its budget. So that's a very valid question, and it's an issue that we'll continue to raise with the department. We have an, one more uh, uh, Inspire question um, here. Uh, uh, if an HA uses uh, software for the HCV inspection, is it a reasonable time frame for the software company? I, I think maybe what is a reasonable time frame for the software company to implement the new Inspire? Um, so I have not spoken directly with software vendors. I believe that um, David Weber might have, um, but I do know just anecdotally that they have been struggling with the timelines that um, HUD has put placed on them to get the software prepared for Inspire inspections. Um, my gut says that uh, the department that will not delay the department's implementation because they are creating um, a essentially a software that agencies can use if you don't have software programs already at your agency for inspections. Um, so while it, that is 100% a very valid concern, my concern is that HUD will not use that. Um, they will not, that won't hinder them from rolling out inspections this summer. Um, David, did you, you met, or you spoke uh, with some yeah, software the, vendors? Uh, I did, to and they, they remain very concerned about uh, moving forward with not just Inspire, but other IT related changes and that they are, that HUD has not been effectively communicating with them or getting their feedback uh, does not, from their perspective, seem to be recognizing what's necessary to update their softwares to reflect uh, all of these new rules. I mean, they, the income calculation items, for example, is a significant change in the software for a lot of programs, and it's not clear that HUD has provided the information uh, in a timely enough fashion for the software companies to respond effectively. Right. Yeah, David's been on top of that. And uh, I saw a related question from Mary Mayrose about what happens if you fail an Inspire inspection. And HUD's plan right now is when the scoring becomes official for March 31st agencies, um, if you're in that category, you're slated to get an official score. Um, and if you fail that inspection, that's it. You, you failed your potentially troubled agency um, as a consequence of that. Now, we, we again are pushing the department to defer the implementation of Inspire for all of the reasons we've discussed. We don't think they're ready. Uh, there's, as, as Michael and David pointed out, there's a lot of software changes that are needed. Crystal mentioned that as well. Um, but to Mary's question, this is why we've said all along that there should be advisory scores for at least a year, if not two years, because we don't know what the whether this scoring system is accurate, whether it's objective, um, it's just too many variables. How are they handling tenant caused damages? We don't know because they haven't responded to our comments yet. So they need to defer implementation. We need a period of, of advisory scores. The bottom line uh, to, to the question about what happens if you fail is we hope that doesn't happen because they'll take our advice and do advisory scoring. And I would put out, I would point out that they did that under FAS when they implemented the, the, the FAS scoring system two decades ago. That's the way they handled it then. So we'll keep uh, making that point. We have a, another question. Uh, this is related to Baba and um, uh question is, does BABA have an end date or is it required until further notice? Um, unfortunately, required until further notice, um, unless there were, I think, to be a change in the law. Uh, a comment here saying it feels like a lot of this is an effort to force PHAs out of public housing 
all together and into rad. Hey, I'm not sure about that. I would point out that a lot of these regulations, AFF, you know, a lot of these are going to apply to rad entities as well, right? The, um, physical inspection, certainly. Um, HOTMA. The, we haven't talked about VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, new, new requirements. That's another one. So quite a few of these regulations would apply to uh, agencies administering RAD programs. Do other staff want to comment on that? On, on the affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, agencies that public housing only agencies that convert their inventory to a RAD platform would no longer be a program, they would no longer be a grantee from HUD, they, as far as I understand it. So that, that might get them out from under the requirement. If, they're, if you're using, for example, if you're doing project-based vouchers and you're using someone else's vouchers because you don't operate a voucher program. So there are some potential uh, escape hatches from the affirmatively fair, fair, furthering fair housing uh, uh, thing requirement. Yeah, and, and, and I would just add that um, while certainly there are things that HUD does to encourage people to convert to RAD, uh, I think a lot of these things are things that either they were required by law and HUD is just late getting around to them, or they're things that HUD should have been doing and needs to do, and they're just trying to, you know, they're just trying to do too much at once. Um, you know, and that that has a side effect of encouraging people to go to RAD, you know, that's okay with them. So that's uh, all I have on that. Thank you. Um, another question here. Um, uh, if we are a high performer and have a three-year exemption for inspections, will this hold true with the new system? I mean, this Inspire related question. Will this hold true with the new system? Um, so the this would be detailed in the administrative notice which we have not seen however um ash sheriff has stated that those specific kinds of administrative things that have been happening under upcs will be or should be similar and then the administrative notice which is why they're not allowing us opportunity for comment on that they said there aren't any significant changes um so i would say probably yes but until we've had a chance to read the notice um to confirm that um, but that would be included in our analysis as well Blake, would you like me to try to comment on that CMAP question? Of course, please. So, it, in you know, I see a question at the very end of it, which is really to others in the audience, I think, or maybe it's to us. But um, I would just say on this issue of utilization, I think what you're seeing is a push from, you know, HUD Central to the field offices um, on on leasing uh, and utilization. And um, you know that that's not going to go away. Uh, what is changing is the way they review CMAP, right? There's been some proposed changes to CMAP and scoring. And if we had time, we were gonna talk about those today, but we do actually have the letters that we wrote to HUD in the resource section, if you wanted to look at those. So I'm not sure they'll continue to do that. That's one thing to say. But I think another just broader thing to say is that um, we met with the person at HUD who's the director of all the field offices because we've been, we hear stories from our members that they're just really pushing hard on utilization where one of our members who's actually on the call today um, was a half a percentage off and, and the field office wrote to her board and her, you know, her chair and, you know, made a big issue out of it. And so we talked about that and trying to, number one, work more cooperatively, but also recognize if, if you're barely a half a percent, you know, she was over 95% utilized and the goal was 96, that should not trigger a major event. There's still a lot of catching up to do after COVID and, uh, you know, some of these funds that we talked about earlier in the budget section, the increase in admin fees is going to help with staffing. And now you can use those fees for security deposits and landlord incentives, and maybe use some of HAP if that language goes through for similar things, and that might help with leasing. 
But there was also an acknowledgement that HUD is having the same kind of problems where they don't have the staffing to do what they need to do. Their field office staff aren't all trained. Um, they are trying to get up to speed. So we asked them to be considerate of our members who are working as hard as they can and facing a lot of market factors that are beyond their control and the lack of landlord participation, et cetera. And a lot of these things are mentioned in our letter to HUD on the new CMAP. So th that's you know a broad way to answer that question. But um, you know, look at the CMAP letter and, and be aware of what might be coming. Thanks, Wayne. We have, uh, we have uh, just a couple more questions here and a few more minutes left in our webinar today. Um, this next question um, states that HUD must first define excess reserves with input from PHAs before Congress entertains the proposal on reserve recapture uh, in the president's budget. That's more of a statement right now, unless yes. anyone has comment. We agree. <laughs> agree heartily. We all agree. And, we... And, and, and I would note that that question, that comment was posed by our former policy staffer, Seth Embry. And as usual, Seth is right on the mark. Uh, you know, HUD can't institute something. This is at the top of our agenda for the meeting with HUD tomorrow is how are they defining this and what authority do they have to, to pursue this? So Seth, we're on top of it and we're with you. Well, and particularly for MTW agencies who have their own agreements with HUD. And so how, how did, what, that's why we're asking what, what's HUD's authority to do this? Yeah. Uh, our, our next question, um, are there any point allowances in Inspire scoring Given that the PHA has not been adequately funded, uh, one on, uh, on the one hand, uh, HUD admits to the lack of uh, CFP funding, but on the other hand, we are audited as though a PHA has unlimited funds. It makes no sense. Yes, so 100% agree with that, and that is um, a comment that Tim brings up in every single opportunity we have with the department when we are able to provide feedback, um, particularly in person. Um, so I will say that no, there are no allowances now. Um, Ash Sheriff has talked in um, the Get Ready session that um, Tim and I attended in person that um, she would like to leave the door open for um, continuous adjustments to the standards and, and scoring protocols, um, you know, every, I think she might have mentioned every two to five years um, versus how it was in UPCS where things stayed, you know, for 20 years with no change except to, you know, memos and things from the department. Um, but I think there is, um, I think those things have been discussed, just not, we are not seeing them um, now, um, and nor in the, I would say the foreseeable future, but excellent point. All right, we have another uh, question here. Uh, I proposed to my field office uh, that HUD should give a five-point score for 90% and up. This would eliminate the zero score impact resulting in letters and corrective action plans. I think it's just if someone wants to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, we can mention that to HUD as we go forward with these changes uh, in, in the CMAP um, scoring requirements that, you know, we'll be working on that over the next uh, year or more. So, um, yeah, that's a good comment. Okay. I want to I uh, mention one thing uh, that Jim, Jim, Jim mentioned in his presentation on the fair housing rule. We, we plan to cover that in depth at our annual convention in Denver with at least a couple of sessions. It's a really important regulation. As Jim pointed out, the comment due date is April 10th. And within the next week, we're going to be sending all FADA members some very specific suggestions for use in your own comments. I really encourage you to take the FADA materials and tailor them to your circumstances and also copy your uh, members of Congress when you do file comments. So look for those within the next week or so.
Blake, I, I think, uh, are there any more questions? If not, we should, uh, we should conclude. Okay. Sorry, I muted, oh. I muted. Uh, oh, we do have two more questions that came in. If we have, uh, we'll, we'll, let's take these quickly and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, one is I have an exit webinar, uh, exit webinar, Oh, okay, this is a question asking about if there's going to be a recording. There will be um, a recording of this uh, webinar posted on uh, FADA's website uh, uh, following today's uh, presentation. Um, there are many new uh, executive directors that are totally overwhelmed with the new regulations and considering career change. Uh, it will be difficult to replace these executive directors. Again, just a, a comment, I think, expressing some frustration. I... I... We, we recognize the validity of that question, Cindy. I totally agree with you. I'm really concerned about it. Uh, and we'll convey those concerns next week when we sit down with the department to discuss our recent letter on the, you know, the everything, everywhere, all at once volume of regulations. Okay. Um, one more question. Well, a comment, Blake, about building up mm -hmm. reserves. And we have made mm -hmm. that point to HUD on numerous occasions when they're looking at reserves. And that goes to Seth's question. That's part of what we talk about when you determine what level of reserves is appropriate, take into account that, you know, what agencies are trying to do with those reserves. So thank you for that. All right, well, thank you as well. And that um, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today and remind everyone, uh, as we did just momentarily ago, um, that a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on FADA's website. Um, FADA's annual convention and exhibition will be taking place this May 21st uh, through the 24th in Denver, Colorado. And registration information and the conference agenda are available now on FADA's website. And this now concludes FADA's webinar. And we'd like to invite everyone who's attended today to please take the short survey, which is accessible uh, via the QR code that you see on the screen now. We'll leave this up for a moment or two for people to get out their phones. Uh, and we appreciate your participation and your feedback uh, in today's webinar. Thank you all very much for attending.